the Lord. Why don't we all stand in this place? Why don't we continue to greet one another? Tell someone you're thankful that they're here. Shake their hand. few announcements to go over. We're the busy season, a lot of things that we're doing, but everyone say Friday. Friday from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. is our ugly sweater youth party. So young people, if you don't have a sweater, I'm sure your parents will have one that you can wear. From 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. here at the church, um, and then also Saturday uh, December 3rd is Jesus Church of Millbank Open House. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Bishop. And then also the 4th is Young Adults Fellowship. And then the 18th, December 18th, is our Christmas program. So we're excited and looking forward to that. There will also be food following the Christmas program, so please see Sister Stacy or Pastor Jared if you can contribute, uh, cooking something, making a meal, and then to close out the remainder of the month, we have our Christmas Day service. As Grace and Selah come to read the scriptures... shepherd I have all that I need he 
lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside a peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Aren't you thankful for that? Why don't we clap our hands, continue to clap our hands, and lift our voices in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're so thankful to gather here today in Jesus' name. We worship you. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Cause I believe there is no doubt For I have seen your faithfulness My fortress over and over I have a hope found in your name I have a strength found in Your 
then we ask for things Lord, you never Lord, fail you will never because your name is your powerful name is Jesus powerful. your word is your unstoppable Let's clap our hands unto the Lord in this place. Thank you, Jesus. I believe, I believe, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. As our ushers make our way, I hope all of you guys had a wonderful and blessed Thanksgiving this past weekend. I'd like to read a scripture. We're going to read Psalms 100. 
We're going to read all five scriptures. They're very short, so don't, don't worry. But it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing, which we are. Know that ye are the Lord he is. God, it is he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So we're going to enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Aren't you thankful for that today? Aren't you thankful that you serve a God that there is no end to his name? He is good. He is worthy to be praised today. I'm glad we entered this Thanksgiving season, but Thanksgiving unto God doesn't stop because Thanksgiving ends, but we ought to thank him today. Amen. Lord, we worship you today. We're so thankful, God, that we can make a joyful noise. We, God, that we can sing unto you, that we can enter your courts with thanksgiving and praise, Lord. So I ask you to touch this offering here today. Bless it. Let it be used for your purpose and your glory. Bless the word that's going to go forth and the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone say amen. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you Across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus.
your presence. children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children come on we're just gonna keep singing it until you believe it this morning may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you today Let there be a lifting of the voices across this place this afternoon. I want to pause for just one moment. Just one moment I want to pause. We just came through Thanksgiving, turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, and over the top of it all, that magical ingredient called gravy. Anybody thankful for gravy? The unfortunate thing is, that gravy has clogged our arteries, our hearts, our throats. And right now in this service, it feels about like we're trying to walk through gravy in this place. Now we get to decide what kind of service we want to have. Do we want to have a post-Thanksgiving recovery service? Or is there anybody interested in touching the throne of God in this place today? Is there anybody interested? And so... We can make up our minds, I'm either just going to be a thermostat and read the temperature of the room, or a thermometer rather, or I'm going to be a thermostat and set the temperature of the room. Is there anybody that's interested in getting a hold of God today uh, and breaking out of comfort, pushing past that gravy, coursing its way through your veins right now, uh, and pressing into the presence of God? Uh, Come on, we're just going to break through a little bit. Uh, Bishop ought not be the only one dancing up front. Uh, where's a young man uh, or a young woman uh, that's going to make up in their mind uh, and in their hearts, uh, this is what I want. Uh, 
Come on. Uh, we're going to break through in this place this afternoon. Uh, we're going to get a hold of God. Uh, we're going to get a hold of God a little bit. Uh, we're going to. Oh, come on. Uh, Go ahead and step out of your pew. Uh, step into the aisle. Uh, step out a little bit. Uh, uh, Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our voices across this place. Uh, let's lift our voices across this place. Uh, he's a good God. Uh, he's worthy of my praise. Uh, he's worthy of my thankfulness. Uh, he's worthy of all that I could ever give to Him. I want to challenge somebody. Your voice is not typically heard in this room, uh, but there's a blessing today for somebody that will shout Jesus uh, at the top of their lungs. Uh, there's a blessing for somebody whose voice uh, is not typically heard, uh, but is willing to shout thanks to the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords. Uh, come on, don't let it just be the same two or three. Uh, let it be a new voice joining the chorus today. Uh, let it be a new voice uh, being heard today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Mm. Mm. I long for the day where we have to say, hey, everybody just to sit down so the word can go forth. I long for the day where we take a break from praying so we can sing and preach for a moment. Amen. Why don't you grab your seats? So good to see everybody in the house of the Lord today. I am so thankful for this season and this time that we got to spend with family. I was able to see my two brothers and their families and my aunt and uncle and grandmother from Kansas City area. And man, Thanksgiving is really my favorite holiday out of the year. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. I think we're going to start a little bit slow today. But we're going to get to a point. I will not be very long. I know that there is a lot going on today. Uh, and I appreciate those that were willing to push in praise and in worship and lift their voices. Man, I tell you, there was a stretch of time in the prayer room this morning. <sighs> Just the presence of God stepped into that room. And so I give honor to all those that were, that were seeking the face of God before this service. Uh, if, if, if that's a surprise to you, uh, let it not be a surprise. Nothing really happens without, without prayer. There, there's not going to be a flow of the Holy Ghost if there's not first a flow of prayer and people pursuing the presence of God. And you can be a part of that. You can be a part of that. We would invite you to join us before service. Uh, the prayer room's open about 9 o'clock. You could get in there. You could touch the throne of God. And you can begin to move mountains for this moment in this service right here today. Amen. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. So no man can serve two masters, for either he will either hate the one 
and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? I'm going to resist all temptation and urges about stature. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 27 in the New Living Translation reads this, Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Verse 28, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, no matter how nice of clothing you put on. And some of you look very nice today. You're never going to be as beautiful as the lily in the field. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take the thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. With your attention for the next just few moments. I want to preach, but first, the kingdom. Would you set your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, whatever it is, to the side, and would you slip your hands into the air one more time and ask God to work in this place. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your holiness. I thank you, God, for your presence that fills this place, Lord. We do not take that lightly. Uh, I am excited, Lord, to to be a part of what you're doing in this room today. I'm excited, God, to be here uh, right now. I pray a spirit of focus, Lord. Uh, I pray that your word would, as it goes forth, find good ground in every heart and in every mind. Let no distraction, let no discouragement come in the way of the word. Uh, Let the seed of the word get down into every heart and every mind in Jesus' name. But first, the kingdom. At times, in light of the scripture, and in awe of the majesty of it, I feel incredibly small and inadequate to the task of preaching it. Matthew 6 and 33 is one of those scriptures. I'm not sure when it was deposited into my mind this week. It may have been best I can recall as I woke up one morning with this this verse on my mind, but nevertheless, I I cannot get it out of my mind. So I come to you today to tell you, I'm preaching to me. I'm preaching to you too, but mostly to me. If you weren't here, and I'm glad you are, I'd preach the same thing. For some, this will sound foreign today. For others, it will confirm the direction of your life. For yet others, it will ignite inside of you a passion of pursuit. Preaching commitment is not usually the best way to build a crowd. But it's a great way to build disciples. Jesus' church is not just about filling the pews and collecting the offering. It's about being disciples and making disciples. 
It's about working hand in hand with God to break the cycle of dysfunction and equip people to live healthy, holy, and functional lives. It's about you joining hands with the King of Glory to see His kingdom advance in Watertown. But first, the kingdom. I read from a longer portion of Scripture from another gospel in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 20. Jesus is teaching and His ministry is relatively popular at this time and up to Him runs a rich young ruler. He, he is excited by the words coming out of Jesus' mouth. He's, he's, he's inflamed by the conviction that is preached. And he wants a piece of what Jesus has to offer. And so he runs to the master and says, Master, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus tells him, what say the commandments? And the master or the, the, the rich young ruler says to him, Master, I've observed all these commandments from my youth. I'm sure he was feeling pretty good and pretty secure at that moment. Everything seemed to be lining up for him. He had his riches and he was making a connection with the king of kings. Verse 21, everything changes. Then Jesus beholding, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. He was not sad about the sayings of treasure in heaven. He, he desired the treasure in heaven. He wanted heaven to be his home. It was the purpose of his visit. It was uh, the purpose of him running to Jesus at all to seek the feet uh, of this rabbi. The treasure in heaven was what drew him, but it was the treasure on earth that pushed him away. He left sad about what it would require for him to get this treasure. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. They'd heard Jesus say some things before, uh, but the Bible pauses to let us know uh, that they were astonished when Jesus uttered that sentence. But Jesus was not done. He said, uh, Unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Whether a small gate or the literal eye of a needle, we could debate probably until the trumpet sounds, but the next verse seems to answer it for us anyways. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? The disciples had the same thought pattern that often permeates our minds and our culture. They perceived the rich as more successful. Obviously, the finances were there, but not only were they more successful, they were more likely to make heaven their home. They confused earthly circumstance with a heavenly eternity. And the Bible disabuses us of that notion uh, because Jesus began to tell them uh, it's going to be quite hard for a rich man that trusts in his riches to enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men is it, imp is it impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. And Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we, we've left all, and we've followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold 
Now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. Does it ever give you pause in this holiday season to pause and think for one moment? Quite possibly, plausibly, we're the wealthy ones. Now, most of us did not wake up like Scrooge McDuck this morning, seated on bags of gold in a safe in your basement. If you did, I'd like to come over for dinner. Uh, I just want to see it. I don't need any of it. I just want to see a safe filled with gold coins like that. But we woke up in a house. We ate breakfast. We picked out an outfit. We drove here. All things Jesus addresses in Matthew chapter 6. Now, if you did not get to do those things, do not feel second rate and do not be afraid to reach out because there are brothers and sisters around here that will help you. They will begin to come beside you and begin to, to assist you. You ought not to starve when you're in the presence of a church of the living God. They will bear burdens with you. But it doesn't take much time before it's so easy to consider our lives, our food, our water, our drinks, our clothing, our cars, our homes, our 401ks, the kids' 529s. And some of you, I just lost you completely. You don't have a clue what I'm talking about. But the Roth IRA, the pension plan from an employer, the things uh, that we've put our hope and our care and our strength and our effort into. I want to speak carefully today because I believe in stewardship. I believe in the proper management of the resources God has given us. I believe at church and at home there should be a proper use of your finances, a proper use of your time, a proper use of the possessions that God has placed into your care. None of these things are evil. Jesus does not seem to be drawing a line in the sand for all followers of His. And certainly there are throughout the New Testament believers who owned houses or had lands and had wealth. And we also have testimony of many throughout the New Testament that began to sell lands and begin to sell their homes. Barnabas uh, was one of the first ones recorded. He was a wealthy man, but he sold everything and gave it to the kingdom. Jesus may not be commanding you to let it all go, but what if he did today? Right here, right now. What if Jesus asked you to sell it, to leave it, to give it away? What if the voice of God rang clearly into your heart and into your mind and God said, sell the house, empty the bank account, empty the 401k and give it to me? I want a house without holes in the roof. I want a functional vehicle where I don't have to pray through every time to make sure it starts. I want clothing that fits well, and someday I'll get there. I feel sorry for y'all having to look at me in my suits. I want to look presentable. I want to eat prime, dry-aged, 21 days, 28 days, dry-aged dino ribs from only the finest cows in all the land. I want a comfortable life. I want to know at the end of my working career that I'm going to be provided for and taken care of. But first, I want the kingdom. But first, 
I want God and his righteousness. But first, uh, before all of that, uh, there has to be a desire that rises up inside of the heart uh, of any who would call themselves a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, all of those things are nice. Uh, all of those things are appreciated. Uh, I give thanks for all uh, of those things. Uh, but it's possible today uh, that I could possess lands uh, and houses uh, and have the fence his clothes uh, and eat the finest food uh, and miss out entirely uh, on the only thing that even matters uh, which is uh, the kingdom of God uh, and his righteousness. Maybe it rings hollow to you today for a 34 year old man to reflect on the quickness of life but I'm the oldest I've ever been at this point in my life and it is flying by my baby girl is turning two in just under two weeks, and all I did was blink. It seems like just the other day, uh, there we were in the hospital welcoming in our third uh, and what we believe to be our finest child, uh, or our fi final child. <laughs> Cut that out of the tape. Don't ever let my other children hear that. <sighs> final child. <sighs> She's pretty fine, man. She, that girl's a mess. Oh. Seek ye first the kingdom. To seek is to understand that it is not obvious. Everybody just get it out of your system. We needed a little moment of levity. I'm glad I caught it instead of thinking you were all laughing at a booger on the end of my nose or something. I hope you would tell me. To seek is to understand that it's not obvious. To seek is to expend time and energy and effort in the pursuit of it. To seek is to desire it, to endeavor for it, to inquire after it, to seek after it. First is to seek the kingdom, subordinating all other and pursuits. First means prime in importance. First in order, ahead of everything else. But first, the kingdom. I feel small and inadequate because I realize in so many ways there are moments when my life doesn't, doesn't quite jive with this. I, I, I'm pressing for it. I'm trying in, in waking moments. I, I, I have a hunger. I have a desire for the kingdom of God. But I cannot stand here before you today and say that I'm perfect in this realm. Uh, and so I preach to you today under personal conviction. Uh, but first, the kingdom of God. Paul writes from a Roman prison in Philippians chapter 3. After expounding upon all of the things that his earthly status had given him, uh, he was born into a, 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 a city that granted upon him Roman citizenship. He was born uh, a pure Jew. Uh, and so both in the Roman Empire and in the Jewish people, Paul had a high standing, a high station in life. It was likely that his family was somewhat wealthy. He found himself seated uh, at the feet of an impressive and important teacher in Jerusalem uh, throughout all of his teenage years. Uh, he had uh, so many things going his way, uh, but one day on a road to Damascus, uh, a light shines from heaven, uh, knocks him off of his horse, uh, and everything switches in a moment. Why? Uh, because Paul uh, got a glimpse of a kingdom that is far greater than anything that this world can offer. Uh, Paul uh, had just a momentary glimpse into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul looked beyond 
beyond the trappings uh, of success in this world. Uh, and he saw Jesus. Uh, he saw the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, and Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, uh, what things were gained to me, uh, those I counted lost for Christ. Uh, yea, doubtless, uh, and I count all things but lost uh, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, uh, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, uh, and I do count them but dung, uh, that I may win Christ. Uh, that's the attitude that we have to rise to. That's the mindset that has to grab uh, a hold of us, uh, or we will never seek the kingdom first. Uh, if he wants the car, uh, he's got to get the car. Uh, if he wants the house, uh, he's got to have the house. Uh, if he wants the family, uh, he's God. Uh, he gave them to me. He can take them from me. They're his. They're not mine. The clothes I wear on my back, God provided them. The food I ate this Thanksgiving came from God. The breath that fills my lungs right now, it came from God. The heart that beats in my chest right now, every beat is from God. And if everything is stripped away, and if everything is taken, I must have a might that says uh, as long uh, as I still have Jesus uh, I've got everything uh, that I need Job had everything taken away and God allowed it God came to Abraham and said leave everyone behind Joseph was lied, sold, and that man rode through a roller coaster. On and on throughout the pages of Scripture, men and women of God have had things stripped away, have given away everything, or have lost much, all for the pursuit of the kingdom of God. Many call this radical, but I believe God, God finds it reasonable. What if your seeking of the kingdom becomes costly? There are those in this room whose pursuit of God has cost them family relationships. There are those in this room who have turned down careers. You've turned down lucrative business opportunities. You have decided to put the kingdom first. But what if God, what if God goes even further? There was a prayer meeting years ago I had. I'd encourage every parent and every spouse to have it in this place. Uh, a moment where I placed them back into the hands of God. Uh, when I held my first child, uh, not my finest child, my first child, uh, for the very first time, uh, something shifted inside of me. It was a gift uh, from God, my precious oldest girl. Uh, but it was in those moments where I realized God uh, gave this to me. Uh, there was a brokenness that began to be produced uh, when I said, God, uh, she's yours. Uh, she's yours. Uh, she's yours. Uh, I've prayed over the years, Lord. Uh, I want my kids to be saved uh, more than I ever want them to grow up uh, and lose out on God. Uh, I've promised him, Lord, if you want to take them at an early age uh, while they're saved, uh, I want you to do it. Why? Uh, because there's something more important uh, than what I see in this world. Uh, there's an eternal world. Uh, there's an eternal kingdom. Uh, and nothing that I have was gained uh, solely by the strength of my hand. Uh, nothing that I have was gained by my own intelligence uh, or by my own charisma or my own wisdom. But all, all, all of it came from him. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. We doing all right today? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And here's the part that often we skip past. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Half-hearted pursuit is not going to be enough. 
You cannot keep a foot in the world and a foot in the kingdom at the same time. The Bible, Jesus clearly speaks to the church uh, in the book of Revelations and says, I wish you were either hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He's not talking about just Sunday attendance only. He's not talking about Christmas and Easter uh, and then forget about it. Uh, a diligent pursuit requires us to invest uh, a diligent pursuit consumes the majority of our time uh, a diligent pursuit of God involves seeking uh, him before anything else uh, and placing him in a prime place uh, and position of importance in our lives he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him the enemy would like us to focus on what we've given up for the kingdom of God. Anybody ever been there? He'd like us to have a sad sack mentality. Oh, I, I could have. I could have been a great businessman, but uh, well, I decided to be a Christian instead. Not that those two things are mutually exclusive. You can do both. But first, the kingdom. First, Jesus we need apostolic doctors and lawyers. We, we need apostolic people that are going to stand firm uh, on the truth of the Word of God and pursue education, and God is going to place them. Uh, but I don't need a doctor uh, that attends an apostolic church. Uh, I need somebody that's sold out to the kingdom first uh, and has dedicated their life to a pursuit of Him. Genesis chapter 15 in verse 1, here's Abram. He's left everything, worshiping a God that he cannot see, has no form. He just hears from him. He's separated himself from his family. He's walked away from it all. He never finds the city that he's looking for. He spends the rest of his days journeying. And yet the Lord comes to Abram in a vision and says, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I've come to tell somebody today, Jesus is your reward, and Jesus is enough. I said, Jesus is the reward, and Jesus is enough. If everything is stripped away from you tomorrow uh, or God forbid today uh, in this moment and at this service uh, and all you're left with uh, is Jesus uh, then the Bible declares to us uh, that Jesus is uh, enough. Uh, he's enough uh, if he's everything. Uh, he's enough uh, if he's the oh, oh uh, I wish I had more than one or two. Uh, he's enough uh, if my money's gone. Uh, he's enough uh, if my health is gone. Uh, He's enough uh, if my children are gone. Uh, he's enough uh, if my spouse walks away. Uh, he's enough uh, if I get fired tomorrow. He's enough. Uh He's enough if this church building uh, is destroyed by a storm or a fire. Uh, he's going to be enough for us to stand uh, together. Uh, he's enough if the government ever decides to start cracking down. Uh, he's enough uh, if an angry mob surrounds this building. Uh, he's enough if you lose your job uh, for being a Christian. Uh, he's enough if we're beaten uh, and persecuted uh, and sought after uh, and chased down uh, like, uh, like we're hiding in caves. Uh, Jesus is uh, enough. Uh, he's the reward. Uh, the reward is not fame. Uh, the reward is not money. Uh, the reward is not even a large family. Uh, Jesus is uh, the reward. Uh, and Jesus is uh, enough. Yeah. Oh. 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 
You see, it's our, it's our humanity uh, that desires. Uh, it's our humanity in the context that we live in, uh, a consumer culture, uh, a consumer mindset. Uh, we buy things uh, that we don't need with money we don't have uh, to impress people we don't even like. Uh, life would get a lot simpler uh, if we would just get back to the viewpoint uh, of first, uh, the kingdom of God uh, above all else. Uh, if we just get back to the mindset uh, of first uh, and foremost, Jesus being uh, my reward. Uh, heaven isn't even my reward. Uh, the reward of heaven uh, is an eternity spent together uh, with Jesus, uh, the one that I pray to, uh, the one that I talk to every day, uh, the one whose hand uh, I held this morning, uh, and the one whose hand uh, holds me right now. Uh, there's a day coming uh, where I'm going to see him. Uh, I'm going to look at him. Uh, I'm going to see a nail-scarred hand. Uh, I'm not going to see a crown of thorns. Uh, I'm going to see a glorious crown uh, as he's crowned uh, in honor uh, and majesty. But Jesus, Jesus is what I'm after. Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. You can try. Feel free. I can make you. You go after it. Go after the college degree. Go after the Lamborghini. Go after the huge bank account. Go after all of it. The trophy wife, the trophy husband. Do it all. It's, it, you, you can do it if you want. But the eyes of man are never satisfied and hell and destruction are never full uh, and the man that spends his life in pursuit uh, of the lust of his eyes will certainly find uh, a place of hell and destruction take this whole world but give me Jesus give me Jesus let's all stand together today as sister Elia comes to the piano Would you slip a hand into the air right now? Would you slip, a, let your voice out a little bit. Go ahead and lift your voice with your hands. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Huh. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Reading now from the New Living Translation. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ exists in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. Heaven is not a figment of your imagination. You will spend a far, you can't even utter the sentence, I want to say you'd spend a far greater time in heaven than you ever will on this earth, but there is no time in heaven. This is not reality. Heaven is reality. This is, it's not about money, it's not about cars, it's not about earthly success, and I pray God blesses you to the highest degree that you can handle and be saved and be focused on the kingdom of God. And some of us, God mercifully allows us to remain poor because he knows if we ever got any amount of money, we'd lose out on him. Some of us, God blesses because he knows we wouldn't serve him if we were poor. But the reward isn't the Jesus church. The reward's not getting to pastor. The reward's not getting to be used or be seen or be recognized. The reward is and always has been Jesus. Think about things of heaven and not the things of earth. If you died to this life, there's a whole nother sermon right there. Too many of us are walking around with areas of our life that haven't died. And that's what we're going to take care of today. You died to this life 
and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Though this feels real right now, this is not reality. This is momentary. This is a vapor. This is going to float by in the wind. And you're going to be 75 years old if the Lord tarries. And you're going to wonder how it went by so fast. And I hope when that day comes, uh, I hope with everything inside of me, everybody in this room uh, will be able to stand flat-footed and say, but first, the kingdom of God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will all share in His glory. We're too worried about our own glory right now. Pursue your own glory all you want. That's your prerogative. Get as famous, get as wealthy, get as important as you can. Go ahead. But the day will come where the most lowly, despised, and rejected disciple of Jesus Christ in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye, will shoot so far past you in glory as Christ's glory is deposited upon him. So Paul says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. I'm going to open these altars in just a moment. And I know it's a little bit quieter than perhaps we might be used to. But I felt so challenged this week to come and remind this church, but first, the kingdom. With every head bowed and every eye closed, there are those in this room that God's beginning to reveal to you some of the pursuits of your life have replaced Him in importance. There are some in this room that it's been the desire, it's been your purpose to go after God with everything that you have. But there's a season, there's a moment, there's a time today to investigate self. There are some in this room that are gripped by anxiety and by fear of the unknown and fear of tomorrow. But you need to come and you need to talk to Jesus and you need to understand uh, that there's a heavenly Father who holds you in the palm of His hand and not one of your worries is able to affect anything. And each of us in this room, each of us in this room needs to examine ourselves again as this year draws to a close for those sinful, earthly things lurking inside of us. It's too easy for the mindsets, the philosophies, the rudiments of this world to creep into our thought patterns and we become so close in mind to this world. Is there anyone today that would like to come and declare one more time, but first, the kingdom of God? I open these altars today as you come, as we join across the front of this church today, as we lift our hands, uh, as we begin to examine ourselves, our hearts, and our minds, and say, God, is there anything in my heart? 
Is there anything in my mind? Uh, you might come as a family group. You might join uh, with one another. Uh, you might be separate for a moment. It's going to be quiet for just a space of time. Uh, but we're going to investigate ourselves in this place together. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I know it's not going to be loud right now. Uh, but let there be a sound uh, of hearts uh, examining self. Uh, if we would but begin to judge ourselves, uh, we would not be judged. Uh, if we would begin to look at our own lives, uh, we would not need God uh, to begin to cut away uh, 